Apologies, we're getting started two minutes late, but I would like to welcome and thank our public comment speakers for addressing the committee today. Um, all the speakers submitted a request in advance of the meeting, and the final list of public commenters uh, was determined via a lottery. For our speakers today, we have a limited public comment period, and in order to make it through all of the listed speakers, it's extremely important each speaker limits his, her, or their remarks to three minutes. Uh, as a gentle reminder, our committee appreciates diverse viewpoints that are respectful in nature and focused on the issues being discussed at our meeting today. Uh, we thank our speakers again, and we look forward to your comments. Our first public comment speaker is Mr. Jack Baker. Good afternoon. I am Jack Baker with the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases, or NFID. On behalf of NFID, as a longstanding partner of CDC, thank you for the opportunity to address ACID, and thank you for your valuable work in guiding U.S. immunization policy and protecting public health. My comments today will address three respiratory viruses of concern, respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, COVID-19, and influenza. ACIP has reviewed data on the safety and effectiveness of potential new tools to prevent RSV, which can be serious among both children and older adults. In fact, in the U.S., RSV is the leading cause of hospitalization among infants and is a major cause of hospitalization and mortality for adults aged 65 years and older. Each year in the U.S., thousands of young children as well as older adults are hospitalized due to RSV. New RSV prevention tools offer the promise of substantially reducing the burden of RSV. NFID issued a report in January 2022 urging a stronger public health focus on RSV, and we thank ACIP for its work in this area. NFID also commends ACIP for voting to include COVID-19 vaccines and the Vaccines for Children, or VSC program, which makes free or low-cost vaccines available to uninsured or underinsured children. In the U.S., thousands of children have been hospitalized and hundreds have died due to COVID-19. Vaccines can help prevent those tragic complications. Adding COVID-19 vaccines to the VFC program will help to address disparities in childhood immunization rates. Later today, ACIP will also discuss an update on influenza or flu. A recent NFID national survey of U.S. adults found that although 69% believe vaccination is the best protection against flu, only 49% plan to get a flu vaccine during the 2022-2023 flu season. Of concern, the NFID survey revealed that nearly one in five individuals who are at higher risk for flu-related complications including older adults and those with chronic health conditions, said that they were not planning to get vaccinated this season. Likewise, only 29% of U.S. adults at higher risk for pneumococcal disease said they've been advised by a healthcare professional to receive a pneumococcal vaccine. But of those who have been advised, 74% have been vaccinated against pneumococcal disease. All these data underscore the importance of strong vaccine recommendations by all healthcare professionals. Additional information about the NFID survey and other resources are available at www.nfid.org. With new tools on the horizon, we must work to raise awareness about the burden of disease and the importance of prevention through vaccination. But it is not enough to have safe and effective vaccines. NFID stands ready to work with CDC and other partners to promote vaccine confidence and ensure that vaccines are used as recommended. Thank you for your time and attention and for your tireless and dedicated service. Thank you for your comment. We'll move on to our next public comment speaker, Dr. Robert Edmonds. Dear committee, my name is Robert Edmonds. I'm an admin of one of the actually smaller tinnitus adverse event focused support forums for COVID vaccines with nearly 1000 members. The topic is of course of personal interest to me because I developed chronic tinnitus after my COVID vaccination. This adverse, adverse event, though, isn't foreign to this committee, a prior member of yours. Dr. Gregory Poland continues to experience it as well, along with variability after being rechallenged as he has communicated in news sources. So please excuse this somewhat off-topic diversion to discuss tinnitus, a symptom already mentioned on the label of some other vaccines. Note, my following comments are not being made to dissuade vaccination, but to encourage official recognition so as to lead to research and early treatment of tinnitus with COVID vaccination. With that being said, I will now review some important findings to motivate this issue. In a recent WHO pharmaceutical newsletter, we find, quote, the UMC identified hearing loss and tinnitus following COVID-19 vaccination as a preliminary signal, unquote. And in JAMA Odo, about a recent analysis of data from Israel, quote, this study suggests that Pfizer mRNA COVID-19 vaccine might be associated with increased risk of SSNHL, unquote. And quote, patients with SSNHL might experience permanent hearing loss and tinnitus, unquote. Now, while I understand the VSD has not seen a clustering of cases for tinnitus in laryngoscope, 
an analysis of Trinet X analytics network data resulted in a finding that, quote, patients with a predisposition to vaccine-related tinnitus may be more vulnerable after the first dose than after the second dose, unquote. And in Drug and Safety, in another article, but with FDA co-authors, uh, quote, investigation enabled us to discover two potentially new A's, uh, herpes zoster and tinnitus, which are yet to be recognized by health authorities, but which have overwhelming statistical support in VARs and are supported by published case reports and studies, unquote. And finally, while the prior, prior papers mostly examined mRNA vaccines and the meeting highlights of EMA's PRAC, we have the statement that they, quote, concluded that cases of dizziness and tinnitus are linked to the administration of COVID-19 vaccine Janssen, unquote. This is supported in part by a 15 versus 4 imbalance in COVID-3001 and their later recognition of an, another COVID vaccine of the same platform having this issue at an uncommon frequency. With these repeated signals for tinnitus, it is beyond time for U.S. federal funding of research into this adverse event for COVID vaccines, and not just to tell us rates, but to investigate mechanisms and treatments. And there may be a treatment for some with quick utilization of corticosteroids after onset, but so many miss out if so. That is why there is urgency for this issue, because we may be able to improve outcomes for others. I therefore call on you to advocate for research and recognition. Let us now help those that follow help them find peace and quiet. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Our next public comment speaker is Ms. Linda Walsh. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Walsh and I thank you for the opportunity to represent the COPD Foundation today. The COPD Foundation is dedicated to preventing COPD, bronchiectasis, and non-tuberculous mycobacterial lung disease. We strive to improve the lives of those affected and seek cures. The COPD Foundation represents more than 16 million Americans diagnosed with COPD and countless more at risk. We strongly support the work of the ACIP and are grateful for the critical efforts required from the group. My purpose today is to strongly advocate for a simplified age-based vaccine recommendation for the prevention of pneumococcal disease, including pneumococcal pneumonia in adults. While well-intentioned, the current recommendations, including shared clinical decision-making, has generated confusion. The current guidelines are complex and confusing to both patients and physicians. In addition, under the current recommendations, individuals with chronic underlying conditions, including COPD, under the age of 65 are not addressed. Overall, individuals with COPD have more pneumonia, suffer from more severe episodes of pneumonia, experience more hospitalizations, greater burden, and worse outcomes compared to those without COPD. The sentiment around pneumonia on our COPD 360 social, the foundation's online community of over 54,000 individuals, highlights the fear of getting pneumonia and the hope that it can be prevented. We understand from the July 2021 ACIP meeting that there has been a demonstrated cost effectiveness of PCV20 without the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine in individuals 50 and over and in individuals 65 and over. And the data also suggests a demonstrated cost effectiveness of PCV15 without the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine in individuals 65 and over. These data strongly support the COPD Foundation's request that the ACIP implement a simplified age-based pneumococcal vaccine recommendation that also includes a risk-based recommendation for individuals with chronic underlying conditions, including COPD, who do not meet the age requirement of 50 or 65, respectively. Now more than ever, vaccines and protecting lung health is essential. We need to ensure that we equip our community with clear vaccine guidelines that incorporate at-risk populations, including those with COPD and other lung conditions. Thank you for the opportunity to share the impact of your recommendations. We once again stand ready to assist in providing additional information. Thank you for your comment. Next, we'll move to Dr. Matthew Ujdaila, and apologies if I got your name pronounced incorrectly. Thank you. Hello, my name is Matthew Voidella, Medical Director for Sobe Inc. Sobe is the authorized marketer and distributor for palivizumab in the United States, which is indicated for the prevention of serious lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in specific high-risk infants. Those who are born prematurely at less than or equal to 35 weeks gestational age or those who have hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease or chronic lung disease of prematurity. Based on the public materials from the June 2022 ACIP meeting, we became aware that the Maternal Pediatric RSV Workgroup is evaluating nirsevimab for the prevention of RSV disease in all infants. RSV is a leading cause of hospitalization in infants aged less than one year in the United States, and the burden of RSV disease is disproportionately higher among premature infants and other high-risk infants with congenital heart disease or chronic lung disease. These factors each contribute to increasing an infant's risk of becoming hospitalized from RSV compared to healthy full-term children. 
These risk factors are not mutually exclusive. Infants who have any combination of these risk factors may be at even higher risk of hospitalization and adverse outcomes. If RSV prophylaxis becomes available for all infants, it will be important to consider how to manage this smaller but higher risk infant population as all infants are not the same. According to a 2022 review article by Bowser et al. in the Journal of Infectious Diseases, RSV hospitalizations account for two thirds of all RSV treatment costs and the hospitalization of an extremely premature infant costs five and a half times more than that of a healthy term infant. Reducing hospitalizations would alleviate the large financial burden on the health system caused by RSV disease. Palavizumab has more than 25 years worth of diverse global safety, efficacy, and effectiveness data demonstrating reductions in hospitalizations and length and intensity of hospitalizations in these highest risk patients. At SOBI, we share the ACIP's interest in protecting the health of all infants, particularly those vulnerable infants who are at the highest risk for hospitalization and developing severe adverse health outcomes from RSV disease. We believe that any new guidance should include consideration of differential risk among different groups of infant populations. Palavizumab was approved by the FDA for demonstrated efficacy in reducing hospitalization across those highest risk groups of infants less than or equal to 35 weeks gestational age, those with hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease, or those with chronic lung disease of prematurity. Existing and emerging data characterize these differential risks and the beneficial impact of palivizumab in reducing hospitalization of these highest risk infants. As the ACIP evaluates new modalities for the prevention of RSV disease, we believe palivizumab should be referenced within clinical considerations that are published along with any ACIP decision, specifically addressing its use for protecting those highest risk infants less than or equal to 35 weeks gestational age, those with hemodynamically significant congenital heart disease or those with chronic lung disease of prematurity. Thank you for your time, attention, and the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your comment. Our next public comment speaker is Mr. Noah Louis Ferdinand. Thank you. This is Noah Louis Ferdinand. I'm the communications coordinator for Voices for Vaccines. I wanted to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine for kids and the decisions surrounding it. This is a topic that has become mired in a lot of politics, including mandates, which I just wanna make clear the CDC does not have jurisdiction over, but I wanna move past that. We all understand that COVID is less of a risk to kids than adults, but that does not mean no risk. We know that somewhere north of 100,000 kids have been put in the hospital by this disease, and the exact number matters less than what that means in the real world. I wanted to give some examples from my local area, Metro Detroit, where I spent much of the pandemic. The city of Detroit has produced data showing parents feel less comfortable going about life than people without children, whether or not they themselves are vaccinated. To quote the report, this suggests that vaccine hesitancy does not reflect doubts about the seriousness of COVID-19. In Flint, just north of me, the public health manager has also told me they've had trouble getting kids vaccinated. But here again, that does not mean COVID isn't having an impact. And much to the contrary, their schools were closed for in-person instruction this past winter into February. Now, we all agree that's an issue, but it's also not some arbitrary decision. It's the reality that you take a district that has plenty of challenges already, and then you add a surge of disease. We have good evidence that says even a case of flu can cost hundreds of dollars in a household uh, with kids in terms of lost productivity, medical costs, and other things. That is not easy to deal with. And COVID is, of course, much more contagious, much more disruptive, and costly than flu is. We have hard evidence that it did cause disruption in these cities just from what happened. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, if we're serious about making things feel normal, how do we actually support communities across the country in dealing with COVID going forward? Um, because it's not going away. I think removing barriers to protection and increasing access is a key step, which is exactly what adding the vaccine to the Vaccines for Children program does. I finally wanna address this point that it's not worth vaccinating kids because the risk is low. And when I hear that, I just have to pause and make sure we really have thought through what we're saying. I met a parent just two weeks ago who actually lives a few minutes from my house. His name is Zachary Yaksik. He's someone who lost his daughter, Alana, to influenza because she wasn't recommended to get the flu vaccine back in 2003, um, kind of with that same thinking that she was low risk. Um, later, the recommendation would expand. Alana's tragic death happened almost two decades ago, but that is obviously not something that leaves you as a parent. Zachary has been advocating in my city and others around us for almost 20 years to get other kids vaccinated. So it is clearly having an impact in his life and that of the people around him. These things do matter, right? In real world communities, we try to look out for each other. We're not just gonna ignore the impact of a disease. And so I think the, the want to protect ourselves and each other has to take precedence over politics and secondary considerations. I appreciate ACIP's dedication to making the protection more available and more accessible for everyone. 
Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, we have Mrs. Kim Freitas. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Freitas, and I spoke about COVID at a meeting exactly two years ago. Everything the experts raised as concerns during the meeting was completely ignored, and these avoidable issues have tragically come to fruition. Efficacy, transmission, informed consent, viral priming, ADE, transparency with data, to name a few. It is a complete shame that you open these meetings up for public comment, yet you never consider what is presented, although you claim that is the intent of public comment. What is even more concerning is the amount of safety signal data that has come out of your reporting systems, which is being blatantly ignored. At what point does this committee become liable for their negligence? These EUA COVID injections cannot be added to the childhood schedule. First, it is not FDA approved. Our children should not be receiving them, let alone the adult population. The data clearly has shown that more kids are damaged by the injections than the virus. Myocarditis is not rare nor mild. It's extremely dangerous because the inflammation caused by the injection actually creates scar tissue on the heart that is not repairable. We already know this injection does not prevent infection or transmission, which makes all of us question why it's even being classified yeah. as a vaccine or being presented to this committee. This is not a vaccine. The definition of a vaccination is the act of introducing a vaccine into the body to produce immunity to a specific disease until, of course, the CDC changed the de definition on its website in 2021. It is time to stop with this morally and ethically wrong approach to a virus, virus with such a high recovery rate. If you did not know it two years ago, you certainly do now. It is time for this committee and agency to pivot away from these dangerous and deadly injections and acknowledge that despite the heavy censorship, enough data has been shared and confirms that this injection is the most dangerous and least effective in history, more so than all the others combined. The strong push behind a product that has failed miserably makes us all question the motives behind this committee and agency. I am here today on behalf of all who have already been injured and killed from this injection and for our children demanding that you obey your Hippocratic oath and cease from doing any more physical harm and moral harm to all you recommend the pseudo vaccine to. The VAERS and VSAFE data both have confirmed that this injection needs to be pulled off the market immediately. We need autopsies performed on every single person who received the injection and died suddenly, unexpectedly, or with unknown causes. We need to be forming committees with embalmers, pathologists, and every medical professional who has witnessed the massacre that has taken place since the rollout of this injection. Until then, we will not allow our children or families to be part of the biggest human experiment ever. In closing, I recommend this committee, uh, I remind this committee comment. of the Nuremberg trials. Your time there expired. are consequences for crimes committed against humanity. Thank you for Thank your you. comment. Um, and with that, our public comment session has ended. I want to thank all of our public comment speakers today. Uh, we are going to move on to the next session, which is now uh, the vote. So I'm going to ask if our team can please put up the vote language on the screen. This is for the um, adult and childhood immunization schedule. There's a motion on the table, which we'll review. Thank you, everyone. We're going to ask everyone to put on their cameras. Um, and I'm going to ask first if there's any clarifying questions um, about this motion to approve the recommended child and adolescent immunization schedule and the recommended adult immunization schedule for 2023. I don't see any hands raised at the moment. And do we have everybody on screen? Dr. Sanchez, can you go on screen? Are you able to put on your camera? Uh, Dr. Brooks, if you can go on camera as well. Thank you. OK, I'm going to start with our um, uh,
Okay, do we have everybody in? Thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, proceed with the vote. So as a reminder, please state your name, whether you have any conflicts of interest and your vote. Um, and I'm going to start uh, right now with uh, Dr. Bell. Bell, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Ms. McNally. McNally, no conflicts, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Lair. Lair, no conflicts, yes. Ms. Bata. Bata, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Brooks. Brooks, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Daly. Daly, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Sanchez. Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Dr. Shaw. Shaw, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Long. Long, no conflict, yes. Dr. Cotton. Cotton, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Sineas. Sineas, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Paling. Paling, no conflict, yes. Lee, no conflicts, yes. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Talbot, no conflicts, yes. Dr. Chen. Chen, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Wharton. Uh, and the motion passed um, 15 unanimously in favor. Thank you, everyone. We can now put our cameras off and we will proceed with the next session. Excellent. Um, we're going to next uh, uh, introduce the meningococcal vaccine session. Dr. Kathy Paling is our work group chair for the meningococcal vaccine. So Dr. Paling, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce the ACIP meningococcal uh, vaccine work group. Next slide, please. The main purpose of our work group is to review data on meningococcal vaccines and to develop meningococcal vaccine policy options for ACIP consideration. We have four initial projects. First, to work with the ACIP and VFC leadership to incorporate MEMVO1 vial into current MEMVO recommendations. More on the, uh, this topic will be discussed in just a moment. Second, to develop proposed recommendations for the new um, JSK pentavalent vaccine. Third, is to um, develop proposed recommendations for the new Pfizer pentavalent vaccine. And fourth, is to consider whether to recommend meningococcal vaccines for people experiencing homelessness. Next slide, please. In the next slide, you will see a visual of our timeline for the four projects. Note the numbers toward the top of the visual signify the months of the year beginning with June 2022 and going through June 2024. We worked hard to stagger the projects as much as possible so that we can pace and not have too many activities going on at the same time. We acknowledge we will be busy and um, the, the workload should be manageable. In the next slide, I want to talk about the meningococcal vaccine work group. And um, a special thanks to Lynn Bata and Jamie Lair, my co-ACIP members on the work group. And you can note that we have great ex officio liaison consultants and CDC contributors, as well as our grade and ETR. A special thanks to Sam Crow, who is our uh, fantastic CDC lead. Next slide, please. All right, so um, in this slide, um, we are looking at the epidemiology of meningococcal disease in the United States to frame the discussion. This slide covers meningococcal disease incidence in the United States from 1996 through um, 2019. As you can see, there has been a sustained decline during this period from 1.3 to 0.11 cases per 100,000 persons in the population. This decline in incidence began prior to the introduction of men ACWY and men B vaccines. When we break incidence down by serotype of a group, we see it has declined for all three primary uh, diseases causing 
zero groups, B in blue, C in green, and Y in yellow. That said, the decrease has been less dramatic for zero group B than for C and Y. Incidence of zero group W and other zero groups, including disease, due to the non-groupable meningococcal um, bacteria remain low during this period. Here we can see how incidence and zero group distribution vary by age group. In this figure, zero group B is shown in blue, while zero groups C, W, and Y are collectively shown in yellow. Overall, the highest incidence of meningococcal disease was observed in children less than five years of age and among young adults aged 19 to 22 years. Serogroup group B was the predominant serogroup group in children under five years of age. In children and young adults aged 5 to 22, serogroup group B accounted for approximately half the cases. And in adults aged 23 and up, serogroup groups C, W, and Y caused the majority of disease. There are currently five meningococcal vaccines licensed and available in the United States. Together, these vaccines cover five of the six serogroups that cause the majority of invasive meningococcal disease in the world, and all of the four serogroups, B, C, W, and Y, that circulate in the United States. Of note, the FDA just licensed a new version of Membio that consists of one vial instead of the traditional two vials. And Sam Crow will tell you more about this new pro product in the next presentation. Uh, men ACWY vaccine is recommended for all adolescents 11 to 18 years with the first dose at 11 to 12 years and a booster at 16 years. Men, vac men B vaccine is a two-dose series that may be administered to adults, adolescents and young adults 16 to 23 years of age based on shared clinical decision-making. The preferred age for men B vaccine is 16 to 18 years. This slide covers the ACIP recommendations for persons at increased risk for meningococcal disease. The risk groups are listed in the first column on the left of the slide. Men ACWY vaccine recommendations for each risk group are listed in the middle column, and the recommendations for men B are listed in the column on the right of the slide. All right, thank you. And we're gonna move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Paling. Uh, you are the queen of complicated slides. <laughs> um, very uh, pleased to introduce Dr. Crow. Um, Dr. Crow, please go ahead. And I think you're presenting first on Menbeo solution updates, after which we'll take clarifying questions, and then we'll move on to the terms of reference for pentavalent vaccines. Great. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present today on GSK's new one vial version of Menbeo. As a reminder, this is the first main project on the meningococcal vaccines workgroup. This newly licensed product will be available in the spring of 2023. The original and new versions of Menveo are nearly identical, so the ACIP Secretariat determined that grade and ETR are not required, and that ACIP and VFC votes are also not needed. The main consideration for today's presentation is that the two versions of the vaccine are licensed for different age ranges, raising the important provider communication and vaccine use challenge. Before turning to that challenge, here's a comparison of the two presentations of the vaccine. The original presentation, our Menveo 2 vial, is presented here in the center of the table. The new presentation, our Menveo 1 vial, is presented on the right. Note the difference in age ranges in the second row of the table. Menveo 2 vial is licensed for two months through 55 years, and Menveo 1 vial is licensed for 10 years through 55 years. More on the importance of this difference in a moment. In rows three and four, we see the active ingredients, adjuvants, and preservatives are the same between the two formulations. Finally, there are only a few minor differences in the excipients. 
The different age ranges for the two Minveo presentations will be an important factor when vaccinating very young children who are at high risk for invasive meningococcal disease, particularly when considering the two other MinACWI vaccines that are currently licensed in the U.S. Minactra, which is licensed for nine months through 55 years, was discontinued as of this past summer. And Minquadfi is licensed for two years and older. After the last Minactra doses are administered, Minveo 2 vial will be the only currently licensed vaccine that can be given to children less than two years old. GSK plans to maintain a consistent but limited supply of Minveo 2 vial for children less than 10, but the challenge will be to ensure that providers reserve Minveo 2 vial for those less than two. To help address this challenge, GSK will send a letter to clinicians to ensure they understand the differences between the two versions of the vaccine. They also will update their website with new product information and, and post the provider letter. GSK will provide Minveo 2 vial through their traditional channels, which include VFC, wholesalers and distributors, and GSK Direct. CDC's Immunization Services Division is updating the VFC resolution and as you heard this morning, the 2023 Child and Adolescent Immunization Schedule to include the new vaccine presentation in age ranges. ISD also will conduct outreach with provider groups. So thank you for listening. Uh, before we turn to questions, I'd like to welcome Dr. Scott Priest from GSK to say a quick word about the new vaccine presentation. Dr. Priest. Thank you very much for the invitation, Sam. Uh, my name is Scott Priest, and I'm the US Medical Affairs Leader for GSK's meningococcal vaccines. I can say that GSK is pleased that the Menveo One Vial presentation has been approved by FDA for individuals 10 years through to 55 years of age. And this approval of the Menveo One Vial presentation means that Menveo will be available as a single vial, giving healthcare providers a more convenient option. Now, we're very cognizant that some children under 10 years of age are at increased risk of meningococcal disease and that meningococcal ACWI vaccination is recommended by ASAP for these children. We plan to maintain a sufficient supply of Menveo 2 vial to ensure that HCPs have the option to use an ACWI vaccine that's indicated for young children under the age of 10 down to the existing lower limit of two months of age for the indication for 2 vial. We will monitor volumes and adjust if required. In addition, a Dear Healthcare Practitioner letter will be sent outlining the differences, both in the age indication, as well as the vial appearances. In addition, we're also changing the presentation of the two carton boxes for the two different presentations with different color stripes to ensure that they can be distinguished visually as well. Thank you very much for your attention and time. Thank you very much. Um, this presentation is now open for clarifying questions. Dr. Talbot. What if you're over 55 years of age? We have plenty of adults over 55 who are asplenic and would be recommended for meningococcal vaccination. Dr. Crow, could you take that, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, Minveos currently has an off-label use of, for over 55, and presumably that would apply to this new formulation as well. Thank you. Dr. Chen? Are there differences in shelf life between these two products? Uh, could we ask the manufacturer, perhaps? Would that be appropriate? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Dr. Priest? Yes, yeah, certainly, Sam. There, there are. So uh, upon launch, we expect a shelf life uh, to be, well, we do have a shelf life, sorry, I correct myself, uh, for 18 months. We are submitting data to expand that to 24 months. Um, this will be shorter than the existing Menveo uh, two vial uh, shelf life, which I believe is 36 months. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I guess my question is, is the why question sort of, and there's a long-term uh, is this a short-term issue or a long-term issue? It, it, and I guess the related question would be, would we be concerned if a child under 10 received the one vial from a safety or effectiveness standpoint? Thank you. Dr. Priest, did you want to comment? And then I can follow up. This is Sam Crow. Yes, yeah, certainly. Happy to comment. We, we don't have um, any specific data in individuals under the age of 10 for this specific formulation or presentation. 
Um, as stated before, the, the differences in the formulation are, are, are limited in terms of uh, no longer having a lyophilized meningococcal A polysaccharide conjugate and instead having that in the liquid. Um, but we, um, we don't have an indication under the age of 10 or any specific data for this presentation. Dr. Crow, do you want to add anything else? No, nothing else? Okay. Uh, nothing else, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling? Um, yes, I wanted to ask, um, are there plans to study this product down to two months and what is the time frame? Thank you. Dr. Priest? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so at the moment, we've made no determination or decision on whether we will be pursuing further clinical trials to extend the indication under the age of 10. We're currently assessing regulatory feedback and, and looking at uh, what type of studies would need to be completed to actually achieve that, and we'll make a decision on that at a later date. Thank you. This committee prefers simplicity in general. <laughs> Dr. Freihofer. Uh, yeah, Sandra Freiho for American Medical Association, uh, asking a question as a practicing physician. I've had some patients that have needed um, men meningococcal vaccination uh, that are over 55, as was mentioned earlier. And because of their um, insurance coverage, I've had to send them to the pharmacy and I've really had a hard time getting the pharmacist to administer the vaccine, even though I've written a prescription. In fact, I've had to take a screenshot of the adult schedule and send it with the patient to show to the pharmacist. So um, is there any educational part of um, any education that we're doing to try to um, make some of these off-label uses known and um, any suggestions how we can make, make that process easier for patients to get the vaccines that they need and that are indicated? Uh, thank you, Doctor, for the questions. Um, so uh, I should note that uh, Menquadfi, one of the three vaccines currently licensed in the U.S., is actually for ages uh, two years and up. Uh, so that hopefully will be an option regardless. In terms of clarification, um, uh, we do have it in our ACIP documentation, but I can work with the work of Chair, um, Dr. Paling, and others to, um, uh, to investigate that issue further. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Um, Dr. Cruz, I want to ask one more question. I appreciate that you have um, said there there's going to be some color coding differences between the one vial and the two vial. Um, recognizing that a portion of the United States is colorblind, is there other, going to be other, could you describe what the changes are and is there other, any other indications to make it obvious for people who are colorblind? Thank you. Dr. Preece? Yeah, thank you for the question. So there are a number of different difference, uh, differences that we've made between the two presentations uh, to, to ensure that there are multiple opportunities to visually identify the differences between the two presentations. Uh, on the cartons themselves, they clearly state whether you require one vial per dose or two vial per dose. Uh, in addition, the uh, colour strip down the two vial presentation is purple, whereas the colour strip down the one vial presentation is, is, a, is a dove grey. Um, in addition, we clearly state the age indication uh, on the box carton. We also state on one that reconstitution is required and on the other, the one vial that reconstitution is not required. When we get into the boxes themselves, the two vials for the two vial uh, presentation, one vial is gray and that is the liquid containing vial. A second vial is orange in terms of the cap lid and that is a lyophilized powder, a white powder. Uh, for the one vial, the, uh, there's only obviously only one colour lid and that is pink, but the, uh, the contents of that vial is liquid. And finally, on the vials themselves is further reiterated the age indication for the product in clear legible writing, as well as uh, whether this particular product requires reconstitution or whether it doesn't require constitution. And in the case of the one vial presentation, it also clearly states that this is one vial of one, whereas for the two vial, we will have one vial of two and two vial of two on the uh, respective labels for the vials. I hope that's helpful. 
And uh, this is uh, Sam Crow for for the committee as well. This, these materials are actually in your background materials. So if you if you'd care to see the images and what Dr. Priest has described, uh, please look there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Priest, I just wanted to thank you for that very thorough response. We're going to move on to the next uh, presentation uh, on ETR, or terms of reference. Apologies. Dr. Crow? Uh, thank you. And so now on to our final presentation covering the work group's plans for assessing the pentavalent meningococcal conjugate serogroup ABCWI vaccines. Sorry, some technical difficulties. So as a reminder, uh, these assessments are the second and third projects the work group is tackling in the near term. There are two new MIN ABCWY vaccines currently in clinical trials. One is produced by GSK and the other by Pfizer. Each vaccine is a combination of an existing MIN ACWY vaccine and an existing MIN B vaccine. The meningococcal vaccines work group will assess each of these pentavalent vaccines separately in the coming months. The tentative goal is to have votes on these vaccines at the October 2023 ACIP meeting, presuming licensure has occurred. The GSK vaccine is comprised of Menveo 1 vial and Bexero, which is a serogroup group B vaccine. Both of these vaccines are currently licensed in the United States. Clinical trials are assessing a two-dose schedule at zero and six months. The company is studying the immunogenicity and safety of the vaccine on patients aged 10 through 25 years, and doing so in both min ACWY primed and naive patients. Longer interval studies are underway, but they will not be completed before licensure and ACIP vote. The Pfizer vaccine is comprised of Nememrex serogroups A, C, W, and Y, and Tremimba serogroup B. Tremimba is currently licensed and available in the US. Nememrex is not, but is extensively used in Europe and elsewhere. Pfizer's clinical trials are assessing a two-dose schedule at zero and six months and at zero and 12 months and another schedule with two doses at 11 to 12 years and a booster at 16 years. They are also assessing a single dose of pentavalent as an alternative to MIN-ACWY vaccine. They are studying the effect of the vaccine on patients aged 10 through 25 years and doing so in both MIN-ACWY primed and naive patients. Longer interval studies are also underway, but they will not be completed before licensure or ACIP vote. When tackling these assessments, the work group plans to review the epidemi epidemiology of meningococcal disease, immunogenicity, and safety data for each vaccine, and the expected public health impact of the vaccines. Finally, the work group will use GRADE and ETR to assess the vaccines. This, this slide lists three policy questions the work group decided upon for each pentavalent vaccine. First, should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for men ACWY and men B vaccination in people currently recommended to receive both vaccines? So a 16 year olds are an example of this. They're recommended to get men ACWY and can get men B based on shared clinical decision making. Second, should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive men ACWY only? An example would be 11 to 12 year olds. Third, should the pentavalent vaccine be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive men B only? For example, during a serogroup B outbreak. Of note, the work group decided to add the second and third policy questions because of concern that some providers might not carry men ACWI and men B vaccines once the pentavalent vaccines become available. The next few slides show the proposed PICOs. There are six in total, three for the GSK vaccine and three for the Pfizer vaccine. Not to be overly repetitive, I'll only show three generic versions here. This slide focuses on the first policy question and asks whether the pentavalent vaccine should be included as an option for men ACWI, men B vaccination, and people currently recommended to receive both vaccines. As noted, the PICOs are very similar to one another, so I've highlighted the key differences on each slide. The population of each of the PICOs will be all individuals aged 10 years or older currently recommended to receive the licensed vaccines. 
The intervention will be the pentavalent vaccine under consideration. The comparison will be the currently licensed vaccines and the outcomes will be those listed at the bottom of the table and more on those outcomes in one moment. This is the second PICO, which focuses on the pentavalent vaccine, uh, whether it should be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive mini CWI only. And this is the third PICO, focusing on whether the pentavalent vaccine should be included as an option for people currently recommended to receive MinB only. After determining the policy questions in PICOs, the workgroup members rated the importance of the six outcomes listed here. Meningococcal disease, short-term immunity, and serious adverse events were deemed critical, while persistent immunity, interference with other vaccines, and non-serious adverse events were deemed important. Of note, there will be opportunities to revise these assessments later in the process if needed. As mentioned, the hope of the work group is to complete its review of these two vaccines in one year with an anticipated vote next October, presuming the vaccines are licensed by the ACIP meeting date. In February, we will present the epidemiology of meningococcal disease in the United States and the two companies, GSK and Pfizer, will give their manufacturers presentations. In June, we will present the grade and ETR findings and expected public health impact of the vaccines. Thank you for listening. Uh, Dr. Paling and I are happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Crow. This presentation is now open for questions. We'll start with Dr. Chen. So uh, maybe it's my naivete, but for the outcomes, of immunity, are they based on a, a specific cutoff titer for serum bactericidal antibody, or is it some proportion of seroconversions of fourfold over baseline, or some other measure? I, I guess I, I'm not familiar with what the immunologic outcome measures would be based on. So I'm uh, rather new at this. So we have a meningococcal disease expert who's at the table with us, Dr. McNamara, if you uh, could comment. Thank you. Sure. Yes, this is Dr. McNamara from the CDC's bacterial meningitis epidemiology team. So typically serum bactericidal assay is used um, for the correlative protection for meningococcal vaccines. Um, I'm not sure if actually if the manufacturers are on the line, they might be able to comment on exactly what will be used um, as the correlate for licensure for these vaccines, but we'll be, be looking generally at SBA data for this. I'm, I'm happy to allow, allow for any manufacturer input on the outcomes in the trials if that can be shared at this time. If so, uh, please just raise your hand. Otherwise, we will move on to other questions. Dr. Lair. Um, I want to, as a member of the work group, I want to reemphasize something that Dr. Crow said. If you could go to slide seven. We do have three questions, and it's relatively important because I thought we only needed one when I started on this work group. We just needed to know if you could do both MEN-B and MEN-A in one. But there was a strong consideration that some practices would only carry the new pentavalent vaccine. And so we thought it was very important to decide, is that a reasonable thing to do? And that's where the second and third question come from. So that's something I had not considered and I think is a valuable question. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Dr. Long? I think that the um, use of a pentavalent vaccine would convert a shared decision-making recommendation to a recommendation. And I, I would want to have the work group think a lot about the low burden of disease. And the low burden of disease, you know, the trust of the, of the American people in our policies is that they're taking a risk, however it is small, of every vaccine because there's a burden of disease that we consider worth the risk. So immunizing millions of older teenagers with a vaccine with the efficacy as it is or isn't for these vaccines and for the very low risk of um, 
disease uh, is something that I would want to hear a lot more about. Uh, Dr. Paling would like to respond. Um, I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Long and to Dr. Lair for their comments. And that is the purpose of the three specific questions, um, because we do think that each one is very important to consider. And thank you for highlighting that. Thank you. Dr. Daly? Um, yeah, one quick question about presentation and then sort of a bigger picture question. The presentation question is, uh, um, it's, it, it will be a true pentavalent, and the, the B is essentially added to the AC, ACWY that was used, and it would be a sort of a similar, you know, 0.5 ml single injection. Okay. Um, so then the other is, is there, it feels like there's precedent for giving a multi-antigen vaccine for an outbreak, like giving MMR for a mumps outbreak, and is, it, is that helpful or is that not helpful? Thank you. So, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so, actually, the ACIP secretary pointed uh, pointed uh, me to a document that was actually published in 1999 about this particular issue, where it noted that uh, combination vaccines may be used whenever any components of the co combination are indicated, and its other components are not contraindicated. Uh, and the provider might not have um, other uh, in instances when the provider might have other vaccines available, or when the provider might prefer to use the combo vaccine and uh, it recommends that the benefits and risks um, uh, to administering the combo vaccine uh, should be considered uh, and compared during the process. That's something we will be doing, I think, in the workgroup deliberations. Uh, but there is some precedent for that. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go to Ms. McNally, um, and after that, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you. So I just want to make sure I am understanding these policy questions. And in, in trying to understand them, I'm thinking through a scenario where you would have someone who is vaccinated with the two-dose series against ACWI at 11 or 12, and then again at 16. And then that individual chose to get vaccinated against men B, let's say at age 16, but they only have one dose so far. So is the, the consideration that they may then get this pentavalent vaccine, and if so, um, what harm is there to the revaccination with ACWI, if any? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McNally. Those, those are actually the questions I think the work group will be deliberating on over the next year. Uh, there is um, uh, uh, some precedent, as I was saying, for, for having combined vaccines, but the approach of the work group at this point is, is to look at how the pentavalent vaccines can fit within the current ACIP schedule. Uh, and if uh, changes to that schedule are warranted in the future, uh, we'll, we'll turn to that then. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you for that presentation. I guess um, what I would like to see also is a reassessment of the 11 to 12 year old vaccine with, with a meningococcal vaccine. And I don't know if that's something the work group will take up, but um, do we need to give meningococcal vaccine at 11 to 12 years? Um, with the low burden of disease, um, and they, should we just advocate for the 16-year-old pre-college? And I would like to see whether the work group can either reconfirm that recommendation or reassess, at least reassess. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. That's a, an important question and one that we've been deliberating on. The work group has, at least, excuse me. Uh, and at, at this point, uh, the intention is to look at the, the pentavalent vaccines first, uh, just given the complexity of addressing both vaccines at the same time, uh, but independently from one another. Uh, but as you can imagine, these types of questions are arising throughout the process, and I'm sure will over the next year. So we'll, we'll be back in touch with the committee as, as uh, we learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to... Uh, we're doing last round, so Dr. Talbot, then Dr. Sineas. We'll go to Dr. Balmer and Dr. Goldman, and then we will uh, move on to the next session. I'll be fast. Just for, for clarification, I thought the idea was to create a second vaccine period so that they would come in early adolescence and get multiple vaccines to facilitate higher vaccination rates. Is that correct? Sorry, Dr. Hal, but I'm not uh, uh, familiar with the, the 
what, what you're describing. Because don't they get HPV at the same time? And HPV starts at um, 11, um, can start as soon as 9. The fundamental question is about the adolescent platform. Does it need to sit at that adolescent platform, or do we have a late adolescent platform is fundamentally the issue. Dr. Sineas? Thank you. As a follow-up to Dr. Long's question about the shared decision-making on the MenB uh, for after age 16, do we know what the current uptake of MenB vaccination is, is in that age group? Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I think it's around 30%. That was what we reported last year for a single dose, and I don't believe we have data for two doses, although it might be lower. Uh, Dr. McNamara? Yes, I was just going to say, I think um, the data that we have on the complete two-dose series for MenB, it's usually about half of people who start a series appear to complete it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Balmer? Uh, Dr. Balmer, Thank you're you, Pfizer. Just want to... Thank you, Doctor. Yes, so I, I just wanted to go back to the very first question. I think it was from Dr. Chen on uh, the actual outcomes. And uh, just to add to what Dr. McNamara um, gave the, the committee in terms of information, the, the Pfizer pentavalent vaccine will be based on licensure criteria, which is looking at zero response. So a fourfold zero response of um, HSBA titers for all five zero groups. And for our men B component, we're also doing an additional licensure endpoint of a composite HSBA response, which is a, an HSBA titer against all four men B strains that we're testing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Balmer and Dr. Goldman. Thank you. I'll be brief. One of the things that you may want to look at is the dosing schedule if the manufacturers want to look at that in the future. You know, I stock both types of vaccines in my practice. And what I find is, you know, many of the pre-college physicals, they're in a panic to get their vaccines in. And having a schedule where you get it at zero and then one month later, they can fit it in in the summertime. But if we're at zero in six months, uh, they may not be able to get all of their vaccines in that they want before they get off to college. So I, it would be very helpful having a pentavalent, but if we're doing a extended dosing schedule, that may make it more difficult to implement. I don't know if that's something that can be looked at or if that's more manufacturer driven. Over. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. Um, I'll ask the work group to take that under advisement. Um, Dr. Priest, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond from GSK if you would like. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. So in terms of our pentavalence study, looking at non-inferiority in terms of MenB responses, we'll actually be uh, using a panel of 110 uh, diverse wild type strains uh, to to uh, to look at the effect of the antibodies at, at uh, actually uh, killing those those strains um, within the context of an endogenous complement assay. Um, which which we will we will discuss more about um, in terms of uh, non inferiority for ACWY we use the the standard assays for that for a fourfold. Thank you. And then my last two quick uh, uh, questions: If you can just uh, define what short term means, it means many different things to many different people. So, um, and then the last is just to make sure, of course, that we're incorporating equity in many of the domains. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, we are going to actually move on in a moment to the influenza session. I want to thank all the presenters uh, for the meninge session. Um, we're going to give just a couple of minutes for this transition to happen, um, and then we'll reconvene in just two to three minutes. Thank you, everybody.